Uh, one again, just thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, some of us a little last notice, last minute. I want to thank uh, Captain Joe for making it all possible. Uh, we had some slight issues with the with American Red season and everything else going on, but uh, glad that everybody made it out. Um, obviously, we we talked about what we got going on our membership raffle with the Maui Gems. Um, what else we got going, Dan? Well, Captain Joe, I tell you, he's got a lot of experience. He's got experience in the Northeast. His family didn't your family have like a marina in the Northeast for at one time? What what part was that? Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Massachusetts to the Keys. The yeah, his dad. His, his dad's a character. You ever want to meet his dad? He's over at the Tiki Hut every day. Is he not there every day? Is he? Hold the bar down. Hold the bar down. Yeah. All right. Now, without further ado, we're going to bring out Captain Joe McFarland. Cal. All right, so, uh, yeah, both microphones, I tell you, we're going to do that, okay. All right, so, uh, yeah, like a couple days ago, oh, yep, let's do this. Tommy just having to catch me at the right moment. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, just happened to be cruising by the marina for a real quick uh, splash of gas and <laughs> caught me a little off guard. But, uh, anyways, uh, he asked me to do a seminar today, and, and we were sitting there talking about what, what kind of seminar should we do and how do we want to do this. And instead of just talking about fishing or some you know tactics to catch grouper or something, I said, let's do one about like how to get the boat ready, how to do something a little different uh, that I feel like a lot of people may not cover very often. So try to do something that might be informative. Uh, a little bit about myself. My name's Captain Joe McFarlane. I've been a captain all my life. Uh, I started Pure Vita Charters with my brother. We were talking about him and my dad there at Bay Pines Marina. Uh, right now I run a 100 foot yacht up in Clearwater. Uh, I've traveled all through the Bahamas and the Caribbean and all over Florida. And uh, it, fishing's my passion. So uh, I'm also a vessel systems repair expert. I've worked for at least 10 years doing service locally here. Had a bunch of bands and we did mainly yacht service on large systems. Uh, learned a lot through that, but also ran a large group of guys fixing stuff, so got a lot of experience there. Uh, so, talking about tournaments, basically, how do you get the boat ready for the tournament? And that goes into a couple different things. There's one side of it, which is the actual physical side of getting the actual vessel ready and all of her systems. And then there's the side of getting, like, your boat and your crew and all of what it is together. So. Uh, that's kind of what I want to go into, and there's a couple things to say. If anybody has any questions, you know, I'm happy to entertain them. Just, I'd, I'd rather break it up with questions than just blot out everything I wrote down. So, okay, yeah, all right, this is going great. <laughs> all right, so let's get started. Uh, you know, when you think of tournaments, it, there's so many different kinds of tournaments. It could be a kayak tournament, offshore, inshore, marlin fishing, you know, it, it, there's so many different options. What I think of uh, in my experience has been mainly offshore experiences. I feel like a lot of what goes on offshore trickles down into all the other tournaments. So when I talk about like servicing your engines, if you are on an inshore boat and you only have one, it makes sense too. So a lot of stuff like that. Um, you know, a tournament's gonna tax basically all of your systems, all of what your boat has, all of what you can possibly do, and all of what your team can possibly do. It's rewarding, you, you know, it's expensive, it can be great when you win. It can be really crappy when you don't. You spend all your money and time doing this, but uh, I think in all of my experience, I've found that the best part about doing well in tournaments and not necessarily winning, but doing well is putting together a good team and a good boat and putting it all, you know, bringing all of that together. So let's get started with uh, your vessel. I think what's paramount here is to talk about safety and having all of your safety gear figured out you know, everybody says, oh, you have to have life jackets and you have to have a throw ring and all those things. Uh, what, what I feel is most important about safety gear is getting to know your safety gear, understanding it, testing it, and checking it regularly. So one of the things that I do monthly on the yacht is we go through and we check every single life jacket. We check the throw rings, we check the EPER, we check the PLV. And I make sure that everything is in working order. It's not just... Uh, yeah, we have life jackets and they're down there in that hole. It's pulling them out, 
testing the straps, you know, does everything look like it's stitched and nobody accidentally hit it with bleach? Are the glow sticks all okay and the whistles aren't falling apart? You know, understanding that, it, that's imperative to, especially if you're gonna be out fishing your ass off, you probably wanna have some good safety gear. Uh, you know, when it comes to like your EPER, I check mine every month. So we run the test, it goes off, it beeps, I make sure that it does work, that it's in place, that it's gonna activate when we need it and that my crew members all know how to use it. So when you're talking about the rest of your crew when you're in a tournament, you know, I, I feel as if I've seen many times where it's like, Tommy, you wanna fish in a tournament with me? Oh, heck yeah, man, I'll go. It's like, jump in, let's do this. And then here you are 20 miles offshore and it's like, uh, wait, things are going wrong. Where's the, where's the EPER? Like, uh, whoa, how do we do this? And all of a sudden, we got a whole new set of problems because you're not informing your crew and getting that all figured out ahead of time. So when it comes to safety gear, think about those things and, and trying to uh, bring that together. I, you know, I can't say enough, uh, getting a safety checklist. I know it sounds really lame, but I have this once a month checklist that I use to just make sure that I don't forget something. And by having that, it makes a big deal. Yeah? Everybody good with that? Makes sense? All right, cool. When you check the Eber, five minutes before, an hour, five minutes Yeah, they, I, honestly, I, I don't do it when they tell you to do it. I know there's that one time a month you're supposed to do it. Um, hour, five minutes, yeah, yeah it's, it's exactly, yeah. And I, I've been, I haven't been called yet. I've had one go off where I got called uh, when we were checking it. I, and that's, so like, that's a perfect example. Uh, here I am with my friend, this is literally right before a tournament. And we're standing in his boat. This is right here local. Like we're sitting on the trailer the night before. And I said, let's check the Eber real quick before we run 50 miles offshore. He says, yeah, no problem. I reach in, I pull it out. And as I'm moving it to set the, to do the little test thing, it just starts going off. And about two minutes went by and then the Coast Guard calls him. <laughs> and they're like, you know, this is Station St. Pete. Uh, we understand that you, you know, you've got an Eber going off. Are you aware of the situation? He's like, yeah, we can, we're standing right here. We can't turn it off. Like, we don't know what to do. We're trying to take the battery out. But uh, as it turned out, that was, you know, that's a perfect example of a safety check where had we not done that, it would have ended up where we, it could have gone off at any time, but also it could not have gone off or it had already been dead. Nobody would have known, you know, that that's what matters is doing that. So good, you know, good thing to check it, do it. You said the five minutes before, five minutes after. I don't know how much they really care because I haven't, yeah, I haven't heard anything about that other than I know that at one time that was a big thing. Um, okay, so. I got a question. Uh, sure. Talk about safety gear, right? You know, I've been on this year a lot and I've seen two different stinger rigs with all people. Do you notice how they get that strange rig with a the model to get the hook out of people? Can you repeat? Have you ever seen that one? Yeah, so the, the question was uh, you've seen where somebody got a hook stuck in their skin, like on a stinger rig. And to use the trick where you take the monofilament and try to get the hook out. Yeah, I hate to be involved in that situation. <laughs> I've, I've done it. I've done it. So, yeah. Um, Did it work? Remember, Tell us. Yeah. Remember? Yeah. So, um, you know, Ray's good at it. I've, yeah. So, number one, there's a, step right up. Tell us about a, it. I'll do it. There's a YouTube video, number one. That's the best thing that I would recommend you go check out. Because there's a guy that literally does it where. And sorry that some of y'all are eating. He does it through his eyeballs, uh, right? Out of this world. It's like the last thing you'd ever want to watch, right? Yeah. So I quit watching it before that, right? Because <laughs> I, I can't watch that. But there's a YouTube video if you just look it up. But um, my girlfriend got a uh, trouble hook slung through her uh, front of her thigh, and uh, we watched a YouTube video. But you, you just take it and you press down on the one side and you pull out from the other and it'll pop right out. And obviously if you're working with like a, like a plug, make sure you take the treble hook off the plug before you get back in, you know, before you try to do this yank maneuver because you'll just end up with another treble hook in somebody's thigh, yeah. right? Yeah. So do that as well, but. I can't emphasize enough you're right. Like that, yeah. and I haven't done that particular trick, but I can tell it you works. every you time we've out, ever had a hard. hook problem on board, yeah. the first thing we do is remove like, Let's disconnect the rod. Let's start there. You know? yeah. Let's cut off as much of the leader as possible or remove the rig or whatever we got going on. Let's get it down to where it's just a hook. Uh, I mean, yeah, just, uh, my honest opinion is, the only, 
you know, working, and so I work in a slightly different industry where we have like this nice, beautiful cabin for everybody to lay down in, but when we practice like uh, dealing with medical emergencies on the yacht, our, my goal as the captain is to say, look, you got a hook in your leg, you got a hook in anywhere unless it's absolutely critical that we have to remove it right now. Then let's just isolate the wound, let's get you, let's get it supported, let's get you taped up and keep you from having any more problems. And we're gonna return back to port and we're gonna call the Coast Guard or whoever and we're gonna get you out of here. Because like, I don't wanna be the one who tried to get it out and had a major problem go down because of it. You know, as long as we don't have to. Now, if it's a situation where maybe that's required, I can imagine doing it, but for the most part, I try not to because you know, erring on what if what if they're going to get hurt even more by doing that? That's not something you want to get yourself into. And now you're, you know, flipping the e part of asking for help, and you're, you know, somebody's going to kingfish on and the same like that's always going to happen that way, right? <laughs> of course, it's the tournament winning barracuda. You know? <laughs> All right, so. Uh, Back at it, uh, so that, that's basically like some of the stuff about safety. Uh, one thing I recommend to any boater, whether it's tournament fishing or not, is getting a PLB for yourself. It's basically an EPIRB that you can wear or carry with you. It's not as strong as an EPIRB, but it works and it's smaller and it's portable. And if you have a problem, you can set it off and save yourself. So not a bad idea for a couple hundred bucks. The other one is if, you know, for your own vessel, if you're going offshore, you can buy a Garmin InReach, which is a satellite communicator slash tracking device. And you can text all your friends when you turn it on. It's like 25 bucks a month to have this service. Yeah, it looks like a little GPS and it's waterproof. You can carry it on you or on the boat and you can say, hey, I'm leaving. And it'll track you every five minutes, every one minute, whatever you set it to. And everybody can see exactly where you're going. I'm not talking about trying to give away fishing spots, but to try and have somebody know where you're going and what you're doing, that device is perfect for that. And it will, I would guarantee you, if you have a problem, the video will save your ass. It has an SOS button. You can talk to your friends on it. If you, have a, you can send a text message that says, I'm, I'm okay, but I have a problem. <laughs> so, those just a few things to think about. Uh, you know, next, next thing to think about is, uh, how about your engines? Oh, you keep your engines in good shape. That's a fairly common thing. Everybody would assume that that's no big deal. But when you think about being in a tournament, more than likely, based on all my experience, I, I feel like we've run full throttle to almost every spot, anticipating that our competition was going to get there first. <laughs> so, uh, you know, with that in mind, you, you want to make sure you do have everything in good working order. You know, all of your engine work can be done and ready and and. You know, think about before you go offshore for the tournament, maybe you should try doing exactly what you plan to do before you go to see how it works out. So running full throttle all around town is a good idea if you plan to do that on tournament day rather than to find out on tournament day that you have a problem that you didn't expect because you never ran that hard before. That's just my idea. I feel as if I've been in more drag races in fishing tournaments than anywhere else out in the water. Um, so there's that, you know, run them hard, make sure they're up to par, everything's good to go. Think about getting spares, you know, carrying an extra set of spark plugs or oil filter, some oil, fuel filters, having all that stuff as redundant as it may seem. If you're sitting up the dock on tournament day because, oh man, if we just had a fuel filter, we could have gone, you know, that really makes it suck compared to you know, having it, swapping it out and you're back on the water and you're going again. So, considerations. I know it kind of trickles over to boating anyways. Uh, looking at your systems, check all your systems, just like you would any other time, but realize that, like if you're live bait fishing, you're gonna have bait well. You know, the, the bait well is probably gonna run for two or three days straight if you're out catching bait, if you're out there with all, you know, you're fishing all day long, come back, you're gonna leave it overnight maybe, or keep going. These are things where you don't wanna end up in a situation again where Oh, we know we anticipated the bait well would probably die after two days, so we ran the batteries dead. Yeah. Saltwater wash network's pretty good. Yep, that's your alternative. And like that's my next bullet point, which is to say, for me, I have two bait well pumps for each bait well. So if you're gonna have bait in there and you have a problem, then you can always switch over and use the other one. Rather than saying, Oh, you know, salt water pump's your next best option or five gallon buckets. And I don't want to be the five gallon bucket guy, so. <laughs>
So, uh, yep, basic tools, you know, it, I know everybody probably carries tools, but think about having tools for your tackle. You know, do you have a, a, a wrench for your fishing reel that can take the handle off if you need it? Are you able to put a reel back onto a rod if it gets loose? You know, basic stuff, but it's important to think about that because you don't, again, you don't want to be out there in the middle of the tournament going, the reel fell off, and now that rod's out of commission. You know, simple things, but important. Um, any questions? Anybody have any comments on tools or systems? Tie wraps. Your, tie wraps, there's a good one. Especially color. That way you know what you fixed. <laughs> well, the problem with that is that most people don't fix it. <laughs> now you get all pink tie wraps everywhere. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Yep, yeah, well, I carry a whole plethora of those. That's a whole. You guys want to hear the hose clamp story? Sure. <laughs> like, yeah, how how many times do you think I've seen a boat that failed because of the hose clamps? You know, and what was the problem with the hose clamps? They had, oh, no, no, we had two hose clamps on there. Yes, you also did not inspect your hose clamps for the last umpteen years. And therefore, the first one broke like probably a year ago based on what's left of it. <laughs> The second one probably broke last week when you're out there running the boat, like, you know, trying to get to that fishing spot. But uh, for me, you know, I, in all my experience with repair work, I switched away from using the normal style ideal hose clamps or like say Home Depot hose clamps. They don't even have stainless, they have like 300 grade stainless uh, bolts on them. I switched over to AWAB or ABA clamps, which are solid 316 stainless for the entire clamp. They're uh, not a perforated band, so it's like a, the whole entire band is solid all the way around. And uh, using those, they don't really have problems with it if they get wet. I mean, they can get corroded and have issues, but in comparison to the perforated ones, the perforated ones will crack on the edge of the perforations and fall off, and unless you're inspecting them all the time, you're never gonna notice it. They're probably $7.50 to $10 a piece at West Marine, and hurts pretty bad to buy them, but I can tell you that if you spend the extra money, you probably won't ever have to replace them again. You know, you take the cheap route and go buy them from Home Depot and it's not gonna work. And I do some salvage work on the side and I've got plenty of those that I picked up because of the hose clamp problems. And that's like a, that's imperative that you have good hose clamps. That'll save your ass so many times over not to have a hose failure that nobody noticed and the bilge is filled with water and then Nobody noticed how that was going to affect the next problem, the next problem, and then you stop, and then the boat lurches forward and rolls over, and then now you're looking for that PLB. <laughs> Very great point. I'm a big advocate of uh, two bilge pumps in every compartment, and the second pump should be on a elevated float switch so that when the second pump kicks on, it's a little higher than the first one, so you know there's more water than, if, you know, than initially, and also that that second pump's hooked to an alarm. So now, if you ever have that happen, it, you know it, it's happening, but you still, you have the pump there, and the flow switch, you know, it'll still operate, but it's gonna make sure that you fix the problem. So yes, I totally agree with that. And then for every compartment, not just one, like think, let's do it for all of them, so that we don't have a, t a failure there. All right, so that's systems. Uh, tackle. So this is, my opinion of tackle is that this is what happens. You get out there and you're fishing away and you didn't anticipate that you would have to use all the rods or that, well, we could convert the bait rod to a fishing rod or while well, we were trolling and now we're gonna bottom fish or whatever it may be. And here you are when the rod gets hit and say you convert it to a kingfish rod and somebody didn't loosen the, the drag up. Oh, what happens? Oh, there goes your there goes your fish. You just lost it. So, what I say when it comes to tackle is, you know, start dockside before you ever even go. Figure out what your rods are. Get all of your rods set. Get all of your rigs produced. Get all of that into order. But know that you need to have. You got the bait rods. You get the fishing rods, and then whatever kind of fishing you're going to do, have rods specific to that fishing that are ready to go, and not being converted between one and the other. Because you're gonna end up at some point, somebody, whether it's your teammate or yourself or whoever, 
you grab a rod because, oh, you're in the heat of the moment and there's something really happening and then all of a sudden the drag's not set properly or, excuse me, the line's too, you know, too much or not enough or whatever it may lead to and you have a whole new set of problems from tackle. So starting dockside, getting all your line right, getting your reels right, getting the rods right, setting all the drags, making sure the clickers work, everything's tight and ready to go. Uh, you know, planning dockside about spares and onboard equipment for the tackle. Is it worth it to have an extra couple of rods? Is it worth it to bring, you know, maybe instead of just bringing the five sinkers and five swivels, let's bring 10 or 20 or 50. Or, it doesn't even matter. Just bring way more than you could ever need because you don't want to end up out there where you don't have what you need. So can't stress that enough. Uh, rigs, I pre-make all my rigs before I go. So like Kingfish Tournament, probably got 10 of each style of rig that we're gonna use. They're all packed away, all the rods are rigged. If we need one, we can grab one. The problem with, if you have a tackle failure while you're in a tournament, you're gonna end up where you're wasting all of this critical time. You only have so much time to fish in the tournament. Now you're spending that time re-rigging yourself or like producing a rig, which is gonna end up taking away from the time you could otherwise be catching fish. So consider that Having all of that available ahead of time means that all you have to do is swap a rig out, you're good to go, you're back up and running. Questions? Am I doing, am I going too fast? All right. Everybody's with me? Now that we've discussed the vessel, let's talk about the crew. It all starts with drinking. <laughs> All right, so uh, just a couple notes about crew that I think are important for when it comes to fishing together. You know, when you look at, I've had it happen so many times where I've taken other people out on tournaments and we didn't have the discussion about how we were gonna break up the cost to go and what happens if we win. <laughs> and I laugh at it because I say, I kick myself whenever this happened. You know, I'm gonna, I can't believe this happened. Yep, so basically, you know, imagine that You've spent all this money to get everybody there. You've got the boat. You own all the tackle. You brought these people along who all said, I'd love to fish in the tournament with you. And then you did really well. And now they expect that they deserve a majority of the winnings. <laughs> but you never had that conversation. So what do you do? Well, you know, now everybody's pissed at each other. Uh, so my, my recommendation that I that I've followed, uh, pretty, it's worked pretty well for me, is I put it all in writing before we go. Yeah. So we sit down as a team, and then we write an email afterwards, and we say, look, the cost splitting is gonna go like this, the winnings are gonna go like this, the expenses of food, drinks, bait, whatever we're buying, or you know, however we're gonna work this out, we work it out ahead of time. Because I've been burned on both ends, where I went as a participant and spent way more than I should have, and then I also went as the captain and the owner and spent way, way more than I should have, uh, and, and gave way too much away to other people. So I say put it in writing, and then it's known, and everybody's aware, and it's simple. Sure. You know, another thing while you're having this wonderful discussion with all of your crewmates, uh, <laughs> you want to discuss the fishing plan. And I feel, for me, that you know, I sit down and I say, look, this is what I'm gonna do. This is where we're gonna go. This is how I plan to catch bait. This is what time I want to leave. This is my cutoff time to get us back. And some of these things sound simple when you say it like, oh, it's a tournament, we'll just do this. But really, once you've sat with your team and told them all of these things and explained it to them about how important this is, you'll start to see some synergy amongst your group. Oh, he said we were gonna leave at six. Oh, we're leaving at six. Not 6.30 because you forgot your sandwiches. You know, like, not we're not running into problems with catching bait because we discussed when we were gonna get it and how we were gonna get it, where we were gonna keep it and all those things. Uh, you know, understanding who's going to be in charge of, we have, so we have a gaff man, we have a line man, we have a driver, and that's all figured out before we ever even start fishing. I mean, well, we fished before, obviously, but before we start tournament, the tournament fishing. And by doing that, we, like, I've never had trouble where I was, my only job was to run the gaff. Well, great. I never had to think about driving, and it was never an issue, so it worked out perfectly. But... If you don't have that plan in place, you're going to have it where everybody's either fighting amongst themselves or nobody knows what to do, and now your plan's been lost, nothing's working out. These are all the things that need to happen, you know, weeks ahead of time when you're sitting at the bar together discussing how you can make this happen. Uh, 
And beyond that, getting ready for the big day. Now, now that you have a crew and you have your tackle and your boat, it's time. Let's do this. <laughs> um, knowing the rules, you know, that you may discuss it with your crew, but as the person who's going to operate the boat and the one who's probably in charge of what's going on with your team, you probably want to read the entire list of rules. Uh, many times over I've heard, oh, it's IGFA rules, and then you find out, well, except for these rules. But now you didn't realize that there's a tackle rule, or just like King of the Beach, there's a distance rule. And if nobody knows that, and you don't do that, you're gonna have a problem. So paying attention to those things, what are the species, how many crew can you have, how many rods can you have? And the last thing you want is to end up with too many people on your boat, you're telling somebody to go home, or you're getting disqualified, like it'd just be terrible. Uh, you know, figuring out the plan for, for that the day before to catch your bait, to buy your bait, where's your backup for bait? You know, you end up at the marina and oh, we thought that they were gonna have, you know, a hundred blue runners waiting for us at the dock. I'm sure they'll have plenty. <laughs> and then no, uh, they, those were gone back around 10 o'clock, guys. This is like it. So, uh, you know, understanding that, getting into the pre-fishing, I've found that with pre-fishing, you have to be very careful about if you pre-fish too hard, say like you're gonna fish for four days prior and work your ass off and make everybody get up at 5 a.m. and then get back at 8 p.m. and then do it all again tomorrow and over and over again, you're gonna end up where your whole crew is gonna be dead to the world by the day, it's, by the time it's Saturday. And here you are going, you're, you're all upset and nobody's working well together because they're so tired from all the stuff they've been dealing with trying to pre-fish that now we're, we're not making any headway, we're just making it worse for everyone. So understanding that you know there's a level of pre-fishing that you want, but you don't wanna pre-fish your heart out, I guess you could say, because you'll end up being overwhelmed. So think about that. And, you know, For me, that I, it never crossed my mind until it happened to me a few times where you get everybody's irritable, you're not, you thought these were your friends, where <laughs> things are changing. So getting used to that. Uh, but when it comes to pre-fishing, the, the main goal, I've, I feel as if it's to, to gain the synergy of your team, to be able to work well together and work all the, the parts of the, well, how you're gonna act when it comes to tournament day, and not so much of, can we catch a big fish? You, know, you wanna find the fish, but you wanna know that like your gaff guy knows his job, and that your driver knows his job, and that the fisherman knows his job, and you're not, fighting over things or arguing and you know exactly how to get the fish to the box, you know how to get them to the, get the ice, get the bait, get the tackle, get the, you know, everything's in order by the time you get to tournament day and not, not a mess. So that's kind of, that's kind of my key points on pre-fishing and whatnot. And with that, I'm trying to be funny about this, but and now it's tournament time. So now you're ready. You guys are completely ready. Who's in next week? Let's do this. <laughs> I'm taking the applications. No, just <laughs> so basically, those are all my key points on uh, how to get yourself ready and, and pull it together. Um, it, it's kind of a quick list. Uh, I'd like to go into questions if anybody has any uh, things you want to talk about. I'm open to it. Go ahead. I want to go back to this point of splitting the expenses Sure. How do you know that? So the question was, uh, how do you split up expenses and prize money? I will say first, I have done very poorly at that in the past. <laughs> uh, you know, one thing I think of when I go fishing, if I choose to go, especially like going offshore, I say, look, I'm going to go, and, and I, I say I'm taking my family. If I want to take a few friends, I say, I'm going to go whether you go or not. So if you can contribute, great. If it's a tournament and I just need an extra hand, Great, but you know, generally speaking, I, I say we split all the expenses of going, and I'll pay for. The, I own the boat, so or you know, say that's the case. It's my boat. I'll split with you all the expenses for the trip. So we pay all the fuel, bait, ice, tackle, rods, whatever. I already have my own rods. You bring your favorite lucky rod, whatever. And after that, you know, if we win, I feel that it's not that much. Like say you win a couple grand. Uh, let's split it up. It's probably going to pay your expenses and work out pretty well. If you really win, 
most of that's mine. <laughs> that's how I see it. That's not how most of it. No, I, I've heard like a 10% rule, and I've heard even splits. Tell me what you know. You know more about it than I do. I've always, for me, it's mainly been like really close friends. Yeah, so that's a good example too, yes. But usually, you know, we split up the expenses, but then that person that catches that big fish gets that money. A lot of times we donate it back to the charity, but... Yep, so that's another, I've done that too, yeah. Um, give me your experience. Four guys from Bo's and Bo Castle for the first few. I've heard, yes, I've heard that too. So what Tommy was saying was, Four guys on the boat, you split it five ways. So four parts to the people, one part to the boat. I've, I've heard that. It depends. I think it all depends on who you're talking to, really. Um, you know, and it's, I, I've fished in tournaments where you're talking $25,000 entry fee where you're like, how are we going to break that up? You know, and, and what if we do win? Is it going to be $100,000? And I was just going as like a helper. So. I didn't get much out of that one. We did pretty well, but I, I, I didn't even really discuss it that much at that point. That wasn't in writing. That's what I'm saying. Like at that point, it didn't matter. But when it's my boat, you know, we're going on my boat, and we're going to talk about this. What I do, they contribute to the company. They get part of it. They don't. They just get whatever I want to give them. So as you're saying, if they contribute to the Calcutta's, then you know they you're saying they break it up that way, or how do you? Yep. Yep. So you, you, if you buy the Calcutta, you get the winnings from the Calcutta. If your crew member doesn't buy into the Calcutta, they don't get it. I've, I've seen that in big tournaments, like when they do the Marlin stuff, and you can buy Dolphin or Wahoo, and it, oh, well, this one's ten grand or five grand, and you can pick what you want to go for. Sometimes they do help the helpers, like you said. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. I think it also depends on the type of tournament. You know, if you're if you're in a tournament like I think of fishing king of the beach is something I do with my friends and we work together at it. Whereas if I'm fishing something more serious, I don't know, like in fishing in the Bahamas in a billfish tournament, uh, you know, you know your spot, you, whether you're going to be the captain or the crew member and how that's going to get broken up. Other questions? All right, sounds like we're all ready to tournament fish. <laughs> There's no questions. Yeah. Yeah, I figured that was coming. Uh, the one spot. It, uh, wait. <laughs> and with that advice, I'll turn it over to Tommy. All right, so we're going to grab the, the checklist that he talked about earlier as well. We'll post it online and, and get it out there for safety. I mean, I think it's a, it's a you know, this is a little different type of seminar, but I mean, I think it's important. It's not talked about enough. Um, I don't know how much you want in the bottom machines and things of that nature either, but you know, when you, you look at that, I had the captain today, got on the boat, didn't check it for three days, and bottom machines out, it was working great when they came in. You know, they went blind today for AR fishing. I mean, that's not something that you really want to do. <laughs> you know, especially when someone's paying now, like, uh, it's like $2,500 for a charter now, um, you know, with, with fuel where it's at. But, you know, it's a, like I said, it's a great thing. We'll get the list from Captain Joe and, um, you know, we'll get it posted. And take, take it seriously. I mean, that's a big thing. I've, I've had failures, and when it goes bad, it goes bad and it goes bad fast. I mean, when you're on the water, you don't have a lot of friends. I've had boats catch on fire. We hit things, we've had hoses come off, and. And like you said, if you don't know where it's at, then I mean, like I said, it goes sideways quick. I took a gentleman out for a, over two day, a two day trip. He got a brand new boat, wanted me to help him run it. And he brought a briefcase onto the boat. Well, I thought it was his, like his numbers or something and I brought my numbers and he put the briefcase in the front of the boat. We get back after two days and we got my little brother-in-law with me. We're offloading the boat and he grabs a briefcase. It was a defibrillator. Oh, hey, by the way, 
Did you maybe want to tell somebody? Yeah, we could. We, I had no idea it's on the boat. You start flopping around. I'm going to get some battery clamps or whatever I can do. Maybe try to hit you with those with some sponges or something. I don't know. But it's here. Why don't I know it's there? Yeah, you know, I mean, that's... Just to, not to step in on you, but I, like in the yachting stuff that I do, we do monthly like medical uh, mock-ups. So like we pull out all the safety gear, then we go through and, okay, let's pretend that my wife, you know, fell down and broke her leg. Don't do that. taping her to the floor. So, <laughs> but it makes total sense because if nobody knew how to do that, or like my the boss that I work for right now, he, he's an EpiPen who's allergic to bees. Well, if you didn't know that, and he starts convulsing, going all over the place, he's got stung. That could be a real problem, and, it, and that goes into every part of boating. You're out there on your own, and if you don't have that safety gear, and you're out like when you're fishing, you're dealing with animals that have teeth and spines and it, terrible, huge hooks, like and rancid bait. That's you know, like everything about this is not good for what you're trying to get done. So, being aware of all that as much as possible, I totally agree. No, it was bad. I, I like I said I got I was fairly upset with the gentleman <laughs> once I found out what it was, you know, because it was a real deal. And he, his pacemaker was going bad, you know. So that's why I was on. The, but not knowing it's not there. The other thing uh, Bobby Ellsworth does is a big thing uh, to him. He he presets his boat uh, from Bobby Ellsworth fishing bait with uh, with tarps in case there, he ever hit anything that was catastrophic. It, it's everything's already pre-rigged for wherever it's going to be in the front of the boat, the bow, or, or wherever it's at, where he can pull the right tarp at the right time. There are different colors, like you talked about with, with zip ties. But if there's, if he does hit something, he can do it, and that gives you a little bit of ample time, more ample, you know, more time to be able to assess the situation, how fast you're going down, is it something you can do. And it's something that I never saw before. Yeah, my and, dad's brought it up to me. Yeah. He said he's old as the hills, but... But, I mean... <laughs> And yeah. thank God I've never, I have them, I've never used them. I, I watched him do it. And uh, it's something that, like I said, if that happens, and we've had it happen out here when they built, when they rebuilt uh, the pass over here, they had some cutoffs that floated away. And we had boats offshore whacking those cutoffs from the pilot. You hit that piling at 50 miles an hour, you can know it. You can know it fast. Yeah. I, yeah. I could, another experience I can share is I had a guy, he was a client of mine. This is, years ago but he calls me on his satellite phone and he tells me I'm in the middle of the ocean in the Bahamas we left they left from like Fort Lauderdale and we're headed over to the uh, to like Nassau and they're out in the middle of the ocean and he's calling me saying we don't know what to do the boats water is up to the deck before we figured it out so we're it's a center console like 35 center console he's waters up to the deck we don't know what to do we don't know what's wrong or where it's coming from we think there's a crack in the hull I said well get in the water and put something in the crack like Let's start there, guys. <laughs> you know, just having that mindset though is so different than their mindset, which was, "Oh my God, what do we do?" Where you know, and planning for that and saying, "Oh, I know I could stick a T-shirt in that hole," or like carrying a tarp or putty or just those kind of things. Will or uh, bungs like to put into a broken through hole. Like all of that is so different than just turn the turn the turn it on and let's go, guys. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean it's happening. Like I said, I've, had, I've been in the, the and when my, my engine's gone on fire, I just sailfish on it. Like you said, it's always when something hits, but the sailfish is dancing across the boat, and my guys are screaming in the back that the engine's on fire, and I mean, we did, we hit it with the extinguishers, they were spent, we ended up taking them off, obviously I broke, broke the sailfish off, and it was actually during King of the Beach, but um, it was, it was frantic. You know, you got to get disconnected from the battery, but it don't. It went all the way back to the battery. Luckily, we were get up, get home on one. But you just need to be conscious of what's going on. I mean, that's a that's a huge thing, and and I can't, like I said, you get there and it's, and it's too late. I had my boat delivered from CV. They put it in the water at Bay Pines. Came back from the factory, had some work done, and they put it back at Bay Pines. Twice this happened. The first time we were in, in a ladies' tournament. We're 80 miles offshore. Stop the boat, and all of a sudden, Whoa, what the hell is that? Well, CB never put the plug back in the boat. Couldn't find a spare plug. Ironically, I don't know why that I had a bobber in my boat, but I did. 
Because you're know, that they guy. They would jam it into, you know, jump into water in the middle of the night, 80 miles offshore, which I really don't care to do, and jam that bobber in. And I think if I would have put my hand where that hole is in that bobber, it probably would have cut me like a lake. <laughs> but yeah, then the whole new set of problems. But, yeah, but it, uh, I mean, it was, like I said, even something like that. You don't think that it's coming back from the manufacturer. I was in Costa Rica with this gentleman, ironically, during yeah, another lady's we going there. Doing another lady's turn. I'm not going to tell what happened in Costa Rica. We didn't do a TV no, show. No, it's not like there. that though. <laughs> no, it, no. it was about the fishing. Not, yeah. <laughs> nothing else. <laughs> but I had someone else. They brought right, the boat back. There. They brought the boat back, and I had another buddy take it out. Well, when it was at the factory, they punctured the diesel line. Put it in the water, no one looked at it, put fuel the boat up, get out there 80 miles offshore. Guess what? No fuel. You know? Nobody looked at it. No, you know, why would you? But it's things like that. When you get especially you get it back, I mean who would have who would have ever thought about it? Coast Guard did bring bring them fuel. I'm getting calls because I'm overseas that hey the boat never returned. And I'm thinking, what the hell happened? And it was hours because we didn't have, a, at that time, we didn't have a spot. We didn't have some of the technology that you have now to be able to say, hey, we're cool, but we're going to be late. You know, that stuff, made, like I said, it makes a difference. And, and that's just a few things. And it's just, it's you learn from other people and see what they do and they do different things. Like I said, I never would imagine in a million years that I had tarps on my boat. You know, but when I watched the other work doing, they pre-fit it. I'm like, that's brilliant. You know, at least give you a little more time. You know, stuff like that. But I can't stress enough. I said a little bit about it earlier, but one of the things that I've learned to use from yachting that trans it goes down into everything else. It seems like if I when I tell you this, you're gonna go, "Oh, really? Like you use one of these?" But I actually use a safety checklist and a pre-departure checklist for every single time I leave the dock. So not I don't do it all the time on my little center console, but when we leave on the big boat. In order for us to depart, this thing is a whole sheet. One crew member, or myself, whoever it may be, you fill it out, and it starts out with, you know, did you fill out the log today? How many hours were on the engines? Did you check the oil level, transmission oil level, generator level? Uh, you know, are we full of water? Do we have fuel? Are the doors shut? Are they locked? You know, all, and there's a lot that goes into it because it's a big boat, but saying do we have fuel do we have water are we you know the batteries look decent did you did anybody inspect the engine to make sure we had oil the levels are good you know, if you're going to run way offshore especially it's worth the extra few minutes to do that and it, and you can go through it quickly and say yeah i paid attention to all these things and be able to walk away from that going all right when i turn the keys on we're going to leave and it's going to go well and not man i hope it works out this time <laughs> <laughs> yeah because once you get out there it's changed a little bit, but 80 miles offshore, 90 miles offshore, 50 miles offshore, you have very few friends out there. I mean, they, I mean, even 20, yeah, still, I mean, like you're hoping for traffic. Yeah, like, <laughs> you're looking for somebody to come take your spot. So, I mean, it's a different <laughs> thing. Like, where are you? Like, so it's a, uh, it's just one of those things. Like I said, you don't think about it until you're, until you're in it. And when you're in it, it's too late. You know, I mean, like I said, you don't want to panic. You want to be able to deal with it properly and, and make sure you maintain you know, yourself with the whole situation while you're out there. But we'll get your checklist, we'll post it online. Yep. No problem. Maybe Captain Joe, thank you for, for bailing us out and coming out. My pleasure. <laughs> I'm glad we got you one more beer. <laughs> yeah, <man. laughs>